is to realize the impact of your work. So how long are you going to let people carry on dying unnecessarily? Up to you. What is, your, what is the timeline that you've allowed for this then? Well, what I hope is that this, this stalemate that we're in doesn't last very long. It lasts a matter of weeks. And I guarantee I will push for this to, to last for a short amount of time as possible. So how long, how long do you think the stalemate will go on for? How long do you think your... your well, okay, from my side, okay, from my side, every single new trial that comes through, we're going to be aggressively adding it on, and I think end of Feb will be there. Hmm. Six weeks. How That's many people die every day? <clears throat> well, there is a whole group of people who think that ivermectin is, is, is complete rubbish. It's not placebo. talking about them. I'm not talking about them. I'm saying we know the evidence. How many people what die every day? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, 15,000 people a day. 15,000 yeah, people a day times six weeks. Yeah, sure. First no, I get it. Try and get it into the UK. Oh, my goodness. This is amazing uh, audio. It's a conversation that took place between two medical professionals very very experienced in their their line of work and this is dr tess laurie who is speaking about ivermectin and this study that was very very different from a previous study done by the same doctor dr andrew hill and there it, there was a write-up over at worldtribune.com i want to make sure i give proper attribution and it was it's stunning because this virologist and that's dr hill was acknowledging in this Zoom call that his study actually could be, uh, you could say that could be culpable in the f deaths of uh, quite a many, a, a good many people because he had reversed, using the exact same information as I understand, his previous conclusion on the effectiveness of ivermectin. And this has been a huge discussion worldwide. Welcome back to the show. I'm Dana Lash, danalash.com. And joining us right now is Dr. Tess Laurie. And this is the first time that she's spoken to anyone here in the United States press about any of this. And Dr. Laurie, we really appreciate you joining us. And, uh, and I know this is, it, this is, I really, I, I really feel for our medical professionals because this is a very odd place, I think, for, for people like you to be right now because you're, you're, I mean, ultimately a scientist, you're a doctor, you study medicine, you study disease, viruses, etc. And, and you consult on that basis. And now, in the past couple of years, there's been a very uncomfortable political smash up with your world, which I'm one of those people who likes to keep those things separate. I do not like to politicize my medicine. I do not like to politicize any of that because there's there's a time to be political and there's a time to be science based because we are talking about the lives of, of many, many people. And that ultimately is what motivated you to exclusively share this video and this audio with us. Uh, and and I, I'm, I, I feel for you as well, because this is someone who, as I understand, was a friend, um, you know, contemporary of yours. Tell me a little bit about this. First off, welcome to the program. What what sparked this Thank conversation? You. And tell us a little bit about this conversation and we'll go from there. Um, thanks very much, Dana, and uh, hello to your audience. Um, well, I am. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a medical doctor and a researcher, and I have a, a med medical consultancy called the Evidence-Based Medicine Consultancy Limited. And I would work as an external consultant to the World Health Organization in that company and have done for, for many, many years. Um, but uh, the work that I did on ivermectin, I did during my uh, my summer, my winter holiday last year. So it's almost a year almost a year to date that uh, I did the work uh, and I did it for free and I did it because I could see, I, I saw Pia Corey's testimony about ivermectin and I thought, well, if it works, I know uh, they need a systematic review. Um, Dr. Corey's review was slightly different. So I I did the work um, and, um, and then once I'd submitted it to um, various bodies, including the, the WHO, um, I, I became aware that they had appointed somebody. Um, uh, in fact, Pierre Corey had also mentioned it, that they had already appointed someone to do a review of ivermectin. And that was when I met um, Dr. Andrew Hills. So I never knew him before. Um, 
but um, he certainly seemed to be on the same um, wavelength than me in, as, in terms of ivermectin's effectiveness for COVID. And, um, and uh, so we had some communications and we agreed um, that a Cochrane systematic review. Now, a Cochrane review is a particular type of review. It's generally considered to be fairly high quality because it follows certain methods, you know, it's a systematic way of doing things. Um, and so we agreed to do a review together along with a bunch of other really talented and experienced authors, um, researchers, reviewers. And um, so on the 14th of January, we registered that we sent the protocol, we submitted the protocol um, to Cochrane and uh, on the 17th, I read his review uh, and I was shocked. Um, and I emailed him, I said, you, this is going to cause immeasurable harm, please, can you retract it? And uh, he said, could we meet um, tomorrow uh, uh, to discuss? So that excerpt you heard was from that meeting um, that we had on the 18th of January, um, where I was really uh, wondering how the conclusions of his review, which called for more trials on ivermectin, could have been so different from our discussions where we both seem to agree that ivermectin was really, um, you know, it was clear that it, it worked and that it should be employed as soon as possible and he was going to help to get it uh, working together. We were going to work together to make sure we could get that information to the to the government, to the authorities and to the public as quickly as possible. We're talking with Dr. Tess Laurie, who's the director of evidence-based medicine consultancy in the UK, consulted with uh, the World Health Organization and also uh, co-founder of the Bird Group, the British Ivermectin Recomm Recommendation Development, which ultimately was suspended from Twitter, not surprising anymore. Uh, and she's telling us about her conversation with Dr. Andrew Hill, this virologist who uh, seemed to reverse his his position in a subsequent study on the effectiveness of ivermectin to treat these symptoms. And and you had asked him why that is. And I was looking at the transcript of the uh, of the conversation. And tell me a little bit about the because you said you know whose whose conclusions are those uh, on the review that you've done. And you were asking him about the people that were essentially financing the the second study that he did and whether or not that had an impact on his reversal. Tell us a little bit about this because that seems it, he seemed to indicate that it did. Yes, um, in the course of the meeting, he said that his conclusions were influenced by his sponsor. Um, and the the importance of this, in my opinion, is that um, his his findings showed a 75 percent reduction in deaths if you if you got ivermectin or not. But the conclusion said more trials were needed um, and uh, something to the effect that, you know, the regulators couldn't approve right. until more trials were needed. Um, so uh, in my opinion, um, that caused um, a, a, a real pause. It, it, it caused, because to call for trials take a very long time to conduct. Um, and um, so it meant it would take a long time before people would access this medicine. And at that time, people were, you know, there were, there were higher numbers of deaths. And ivermectin is a very safe medicine. So in actual, and it's safe and it's cheap and it's widely available. It's used by billions of people around the world to treat worms and, and other and, parasites. And it, and it gets a very bad rap. And I'm going to ask you about that mm -hmm. in a moment. It, it, Hill had said in the transcript that you had shared, Unitaid has a say in the conclusions of the paper. Tell us about because you say, who is it in Unity then? Who is giving you opinions on your evidence? Tell us about this group that is the sponsor of his secondary study here, his second study. I don't really know much about Unitate. Um, oh, do you mean the author list? Yes, yes. The, um, yes, they, because you said that they have a, a say in the conclusions of the paper, is what Hill had said. And you say, okay, well, who is it in there then who is giving you opinions on your evidence? Because there's all kinds of, and I, and I always like to be careful because everyone, you know, I, it's very easy to encourage. I like to be fact based, very, you know, as you, as you do, because this is, you know, it's people's health and I take it very seriously apart from politics. Um, but I, I wanted to tell us a little bit about that and then we'll talk about ivermectin. And your lighting looks fine. I know it changed in the simulcast of the nationally syndicated show. It actually looks great, so no worries. Um, well, um, the so I never got the names of the of the unknown authors in the paper, 
um, you know, he said he's, he said he would make some names available to me, but he never did. And we didn't have any further contact after that meeting, although I did reach out to him on a number of occasions. Um, but uh, what what would, what is of interest and relevance is that um, uh, I had a French organization called Bon Sens. Uh, it's a it's a citizens uh, organization. They um, um, commissioned a, a forensic communication specialist to look at that review, that preprint, mm -hmm. and they found that there were two to three other authors uh, in the paper that were not listed in, um, and um, yeah, one was not an English speaker to my uh, understanding and and that the the paper had, um, so it had a different, so there were obviously different segments written mm -hmm. by different people and, um, and the one person constantly uh, wrote to manipulate, to undermine the evidence on ivermectin. So this is the subject of legal action, I believe, in France. Wow. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Tess Laurie, who's describing for us, sharing with us the conversation that she had with vi virologist Dr. Andrew Hill. Uh, and I mean, basically to sum it up, and I, I have so many things I would love to ask you, Dr. Laurie. You had this doctor who had authored this analysis of ivermectin as a treatment for coronavirus for these symptoms, found the drug overwhelmingly effective, testified to such before NIH. This was January 6th of 2021. And then within a month, though, he had said, according to the transcript, that he found himself in a tricky situation under pressure from his funding sponsors. He had then published an unfavorable study, which, interestingly enough, was using the exact same sources, as I understand, that he had used for the study in which he found that it was actually overwhelmingly effective. Is that that's is that an accurate summation of um i'm not sure that it's exactly the same because he did um i think there were some studies that were removed because he was concerned about um uh their um quality right so right. i can't say exactly the same i i wanted to ask you dr laurie why does ivermectin get such a uh why does it have such a or developing such a bad reputation with with it seems like when you look at the headlines why are so many people so critical of ivermectin well, in my opinion, um, you know, the, the, there's been a huge amount of propaganda and misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it feels like there's been a big campaign waged against ivermectin and indeed early treatments. Um, but um, I, I think because ivermectin is so effective, uh, it would have been a total game changer. And in my opinion, over the past year, there has to be something else going on uh, at the moment, um, things just don't add up. So, you know, I'm really uh, hoping that by sharing this information, just to show how the science has been so um, corrupted in a way, it's not reliable and um, people really need to look further than uh, what they see on the news and even what they read in the scientific journals. Uh, you know, because um, that's certainly not the full story. And it's and the, and it's it's scary that it is like this. We're talking with Dr. Tess Laurie, and I and and she has studied extensively ivermectin. Uh, Bird Group founder, uh, Bird Group, which is a British ivermectin recommendation development. And can people go to bird-group.org to see your your studies on ivermectin? I wanted yes. to, I wanted to ask you as well. The, the vaccines for the virus, the, I mean, a, are they actually vaccines? Because when, and when I use that phrase and I have, I do not have the medical training or expertise you do. When I use the term vaccine, I think that that is, that's, that's triggering some sort of immune response to the point where you are inoculated. Is, is it accurate to say vaccine or are, are they therapeutics? How would, what is the best way to describe that? Yes. Um, well, I must just say that I'm not anti-vax and people are very Neither am I. Neither am I. Anti-vax as soon as you, you question the vaccines, yes. uh, that are, they're called vaccines. But as you've pointed out, they're very, very different from other sorts, of, from the normal sort of vaccine that we get. Usually uh, the vaccines we get consist of an antigen, which is either a, a piece of the viral protein or it's a dead virus or it's a, a virus that uh, can't it's not active anymore, what's called attenuated, um, or it's a bit of the toxin. And it goes into the, it's injected into the shoulder muscle and you make antibodies to it and you've usually got that immunity for, for some time, a very long time. Right. Um, these new ones actually are, they are gene-based therapies. So it contains, they all contain a genetic code, which is like a recipe 
for making a protein. And um, unfortunately, this protein doesn't, this recipe doesn't stay in the arm. The recipe is disseminated throughout the body. It's circulated and it gets picked up by the cells wherever they are. And then the cells um, can ter basically turns this, your cells into little factories to make this viral, viral protein. It's the spike protein. So we have a recipe um, to make spike protein when we take these injections. And I think most people, if they had known this, if it had been explained to them, they would probably have said, hang on, mm. I don't think I want the recipe to make spike protein in my body. Right. Because we know that spike protein is what causes all the problems with COVID. And, many I, of the problems and I've been COVID. reading about a spike protein detox even. I was reading out, uh, reading different, different um, uh, studies into that. Uh, I hate that we are short on time. I have one final question for you talking to Dr. Tess Laurie. Your thoughts, doctor, on mass vaccinations and effect on mutations of viruses? Um, well, I think it's clear, and the experts far more far more expert than me, uh, who uh, you know, virologists. I'm not a virologist or an immunologist, but um, they have issued warnings, like uh, Dr. Kier van den Bosch, mm. and others mm. have issued warnings that what we do with when we when we Vaccine, attempt to vaccinate during a pandemic because you actually just chase the the virus into a whole series of mutations and uh, and actually uh, it's quite dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. We so appreciate your your time with us, uh, Dr. Tess Laurie, and and I would encourage people to go and read. Uh, because she has the best health advice that she can give people with protocols. Uh, it's at bird-group.org. Uh, I would highly encourage people to go and look at Dr. Lori's work. And we would love to speak with you again, doctor. And thank you so much for, for your courage in getting this information out. I know it's a very odd time. And however we can help in that regard, we're, we're here. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Dana. Of course.